Welcome back to The Breakfast on Plus TV Africa. Let's take you through the front pages of the national dailies. As usual, we will have Ezekiel Nyai to join the conversation. I start off with the Daily Independent newspaper this morning. Uh, let's find out what's making it on the Daily Independent newspaper. Banks hedge against new credits, prefer CBN LD fines. Uh, that's CBN loan deposit ratio. Uh, that's what you find. Uh, bold caption on the Daily Independent newspaper this morning. 2023 presidential election. PDP must conduct fresh convention if North picks ticket. But a judge is quoted on that. And you also have the writer saying, no concrete decision yet on zoning of presidential ticket, says party. Uh, that's for the PDP. ESWAP terrorists regrouping around Lake Chad. That's what Ndume is quoted to say. And you also have another header saying, IPUB asks Southeast governors to release Biafran detainees. Military vows to deal with those drawing it into politics. Anyone who plots my government's downfall will go down, says Governor. Yes, I'm weak. Eh? And you also find, don't allow direct primaries. Rose Cottle Electoral Bill, Saraki Okechuku wants. And you also find Buhari attends IATF summit in South Africa today. Oyo's IGRO growth result of hard work. That's what Makinde is quoted to say. Uh, that's so much we can take on the Daily Independence newspaper this morning. All right, so the Punch newspapers, big one there says, INEC lists core members to conduct direct primaries. ANEC officials, federal government schools, lecturers, agencies, and commissions, uh, commissions, uh, commissions workers rather, lined up. NYSC remains largest single pool of personnel available to INEC, says ex-director. Also, NDLEA launches fresh raids, seizes 4.9 billion naira worth of cocaine in Lagos ports and others. Uh, invasion provost blames land grabbers and miners as Oshun quizzes principal officers. We can also find uh, here, Benanoa kills daughter, beheads neighbor's corpses as money rituals fails in uh, Ogun. None of our 41 members insured Ikoyi collapsed building, says NIA. And also this morning on the punch, Nigerian banks lend private sector 4.1 trillion naira in one year. I don't know what happened to the camera. I recovered at Lecky Tollgate, says Agent Fash. And we can also find here 5.1 million retirement accounts uh, documentation incomplete, says Pencom. Uh, and finally, or oh, a few others this morning on the punch, ISWAP regrouping around Lake Chad, plotting fresh attacks over a commander's killing, says Ndume. Uh, and I think uh, those are the major stories that we can share on the punch newspapers this morning away from the punch newspapers let's check out the nation this morning board caption says how federal government plans to utilize fresh foreign loans as boldly written on the nation and you have some of the projects that wish to uh, you know use this fresh loans for you have the lagos ibadan rail uh, you also have the apapa tinka island port and uh, the cost of all of that will be 225.12 million dollars and of course the source will be the china bank well all of that on the nation newspaper this morning and new borrowings push niger's debt stock to 52 trillion naira that's what you find ndume a swap regrouping in Borono north uh, that's what you also find man worried over looming 1.9 trillion naira revenue loss and 3500 killed by cholera says ncdc 100,000 cases reported. And another caption says, Governors to Senators, Reps, Remove Direct Primary Clause. That's also still dominating the conversation uh, up until this morning. Collapse EcoU building not insured. IDP's CAM opens in Lagos. Uh, that's what you find. That's so much we can take on the Nation newspaper this morning. And now on The Guardian, Manufacturers lose 50% uh, half-year profit to operating and forex costs. Epileptic power supply exchange rates raise uh, cost of production by 30% on 
Also, stakeholders urge federal government to reschedule existing loans, grant tax holiday to firms. Um, we can also find here Igo Dalo, Peter Obi, and others fault Buhari, say failed education system driving Nigerians abroad. Southern groups talk tough, insist zone must produce president in 2023. It also says here Iswap regrouping around Lake Chad, Undume, warns. Um, all right. Good morning once again to Mr. Ezekiel Yayatok. Thanks for joining us. Good morning. Thanks for having me. Always a pleasure to be with you. All right. Um, Undume is uh, one name that has made uh, headlines across the papers this morning, and it's uh, with regards to the regrouping of um, ISWAP um, militants or terrorists around Lake Chad, according to him. I'm not sure why he is the one even giving out the uh, putting out the information. It should be, uh, you know, the uh, security agencies, not uh, uh, Senator Ali Undume. Um, but what are your thoughts with regards to the issues with security lately? ISWAP seems to, you know, have... Um, done a lot of, of, you know, damage over the weekend. We heard about the killing of a brigadier general and four others. And, um, you know, it, it's just been messy. It's worse than messy, I would say that, uh, with every sense of responsibility. And um, I keep saying the same thing. I'm starting to sound like a broken gong. Some things just don't add up. In a weekend that you have a general killed and over a sustained period where you have killings on a daily basis. Is that really the best time for Mr. President to go out in search of investors? There's really something I don't understand because some things don't add up to the best of my knowledge. When you go to an investor, you tell the person something the world has become a global village that whatever happens in my village, in Siak town, in the local government, is known in China because that boy is putting it on WhatsApp or is putting it on Facebook or on Twitter or something, and that is global news. And investors do their due diligence before they go anywhere. So I'm asking exactly what does my president tell the people that he goes to meet? That Nigeria has humongous opportunities with respect to the market? Correct, that's ticked. That Nigeria has, um, just keep ticking, ticking the boxes. But before he goes, he must have been told what is in the mind of the business person. The very first thing on the list is personal security personal security dead men tell no tales when that is ticked the next thing is business security you've got to tick those two before you go into other aspects whether there's market and all that now on personal security i don't know what he's going to tell them on business security, with all our policy somersaults, you really can't tell where the central bank is standing. Today, they are saying this is a foreign exchange regime we are running. Tomorrow, they are saying, no, jettison this and go there. That level of insecurity, which we call instability or policy inconsistency, will never, to the best of my knowledge, encourage any investor. I think that, and thirdly, we know how transitions work in this country. I want to tell every governor, every president, once it's about two years to the end of your administration, cut yourself out. You are no longer in charge. You are no longer Mr. President. You are no longer the governor. We are waiting for the new man to come in. Because even the best of friends that are even where a governor brings in a successor, brings the, carries the person and literally sits the person on the chair, give them three months, and you start to hear a different story. So because of this, when you are going for a second term, there is that hope that you may get it. But when you are ending your second term, you're on your way out. So what do you do? You come back in and do what you call finishing strong. 
when Mr. President is going out at this point, he's like, oh, he has conquered everything. He's achieved everything he set out to do. There's nothing left for him to do again. He's looking for new things to do. Even if it was new things to do, he should be thinking of things that he can accomplish within the next six months before elections start. So going out now to look for investors, I honestly don't get it. Unless, like, um, you know, somebody said uh, um, jokingly, wasn't joking, the little child, when he said, president has gone to South Africa, I said, oh, is he now going to borrow money from South Africa? In which case, as far as that little child is concerned, a secondary school student, president has gone to South Africa to borrow money. Maybe they don't finish the one for China. And maybe that of South Africa is that of elections. So, guy, I don't get it. Okay, Bina, we're talking about borrowings already. Let's share your thoughts on uh, the new borrowings of the federal government and also the plans uh, on these new borrowings. According to the government, they are going to be uh, that's on the Nation newspaper, by the way. The Lagos Ibadan Railway and also the Apapa Tinka Island Port. Uh, this is how government plans to utilize the new borrowings. What are your thoughts? Nigerians will not die in the next two years, even if the roads are not done. Okay? Now, I was somewhere and um, I wanted to go somewhere. I don't want to be location specific. And the cab that took me or the person that directed me to where I was going, there was an uncompleted bridge. And I asked, when will this bridge be completed so that the guy said, Sir, please, let it be there. We don't want when the bridge will be completed. I hope I'm heard. Yes. Why not? OK. We don't want when the bridge will be completed. We want when the administration will be completed. Let them make, make them just leave the bridge where it did. Make them leave them. Make the, this thing just finish. Make them come out. So please, if, uh, if Mr. Senate President was to be patriotic, I would advise him, I would appeal to him not to borrow any more money. When the new administration comes in, they will reevaluate the project, reprioritize, and then see what needs to be done because the ones they have borrowed so far, we've not really seen the success story. We've not seen the prudence. There's a lot of questions coming in. There's a lot of issues of, you know, they didn't sign the agreement before they took the loan. They didn't read the agreement before they signed it. You know, all sorts of things that are so unprofessional and unbecoming of a government of a country. So I think that they should just leave it, leave it. Two years, we will not die. Let you just leave this new project. Concentrate on the ones they have borrowed. Let them just start what they may call a completion agenda. Just go back in and complete what you have done already. Right now, go back and, you know, I've always advised, advised every government that I've had privilege to have a relationship that at a time like this, you bring your project into A, B, C. Project A are those that are the absolutes, what you must do. You've committed yourself so far to 80% and you really want to get it finished. Project B should be what you may call legacy. One or two things that you can kill the bank, you just want to leave this behind as your legacy. And, that's, and then project three is, or category three is others. In the category A, which is the, the ones that you have, committed yourself to a reasonable level of completion. Come and do your analysis and do financial engineering so that the ones, the money you have, you go into project A and see to what extent it can take. If there are some things that cannot be accommodated, remove them from project A, sad as it is. Come to project B, it must not be more than one or two. They are called legacy projects. Think you like, please just allow me to do this. For instance, our governor in Akwaibom said wants to build a church. So because he really wants to do that church, he really, really begs them. He goes out of his way to say, I'm ready to let go. If I need to sell my private jet, I'm ready to do it or the state private jet. Please just allow me to build this church and complete it. Time is short. Then C is others. Let them go because you are doing financial reengineering based on the funds you have and not the funds you hope to borrow. 
when you do that, you sit down and at the six months to the end of your tenure, you have been able to uh, like um, finish writing the, the exam paper. All you are doing is just reading oh. through to dot all the I's and cross all the T's. That is what Mr. President should be doing now. Convoking a very serious emergency, finishing strong strategy, and not going out of the country to look for loans and look for investors. It's a misplacement of priorities or a display of lack of... Let me not use that word. It's still uh, my president. Sorry, talk. Um, well, you, you can only you know, finish up what has been started. If nothing has been started, then you know, there's nothing to finish up. Um, I get your say. point. <laughs> well, let, let's... Um, Let's also talk about Agent Fash now. It's on the punch, top right corner of the punch. It says, uh, I, I don't know what happened to the camera I found at the Lecky toll gate. And that is from, as it's popularly called, Agent Fash. Um, it, it's, of course, you know, it's with regards to the conversation on, you know, what the Nigerian government or the Lagos State government has been able to find as to what happened on the 20th of October, 2020. Um, nothing really tangible has been, you know, revealed or exposed. Uh, but of course, uh, um, the former governor of Lagos State, Babatunde Fashola, says he's not sure what happened to the camera uh, that he found. What are your thoughts? No, no, it's it's um, uh, um, Agent Fash, as you call him, happens to be one of my heroes. Uh, first, as the governor of Lagos State, I I literally adored the man, and then maybe to reward me. They now made him the Minister for Housing, which is my area. And in all fairness to him, he's been extremely good to me as a friend and as a brother. In this matter, I, I wish I could tackle him real hard, but um, let me um, try to say he should not have said, made that statement that way. He shouldn't say, I don't know what happened to the camera. Rather, he should say, I should have said, I handed over the camera to Mr. B. Ask Mr. B. He couldn't have found himself in such a situation where he says, I found something so important. And then you now didn't know where it went after that. No, that doesn't sound like the fact that I know. I think that he must have been quoted out of context. What he should say is, the camera was left in custody of X, Y, Z. Please ask them what they did. And Nigerians will not hold him responsible because it was not his duty, responsibility, or his office to custody any, any of um, such items. So he should say, ask A, B, Z, who, whom I had handed over to, and not to say, I don't know what happened to it. It doesn't paint him well. Well, it, it really also is dependent on how relevant the camera is um, with regards to that investigation. Um, because it, it, if there, it was there should not have relevant, been... the media will not be on it. I'm sure you know that. If it was not relevant, they would have forgotten that long ago. Wow. That they are bringing it up again means that they know that it was relevant. Well, uh, well hopefully, you know, it's, it's, um, you know, the camera was able to capture some moments at the toll gate and we will also help with the investigation. Let's see how that goes. Um, on that one. Okay, let's uh, quickly move our attention to the Daily Independent newspaper. And uh, there are a lot of persons who are saying that, you know, the APC governors might just prevail on the president not to assent to the electoral bill. And you have Saraki uh, warning that, um, you know, we should not allow the direct primaries back and forth actually uh, scuttle the electoral bill. Do you think that by any chance the president might not assent to that bill? You see, I've been in politics for a very long time, very long time, and I've played at different levels. I, I always tell people, for you to be the ward and local government congress committee chairman to a state in a PDP, you must be very high up there, and that's the position that I occupied. From there, I became the national pioneer national chairman of Young Democratic Party, which I co-founded. From there, I've contested them, the governorship of my state on two occasions and might yet do it again the third. So in, in being a friend of the party, in going to party administration, in being a candidate, I have gone through it. And I can tell you that politicians are always miles ahead of us. 
when these direct primaries just came in very quickly and people started saying, oh, it's because the House of Reps have scored a technical point. I, I stood back, go back to my report earlier that I did the analysis on this thing. I, I smelt a rat. I did. And I still think that there's a game that is being played. Because for you to insist that there must be pri direct primaries, very good. They did something that they seemingly give you what you want. And you're not thinking well. You're not thinking through the process. Okay, if you're going to have direct primaries, does it conflict with anything? Direct primaries is good. I am for direct primaries any day, any time. But when you say it must be that and nothing else, foreclose any other alternative, I foresee a situation where it goes to Mr. President and Mr. President is advised that this will not stand in the weight, this will stand the weight of the law, that there's going to be this and there's going to be that. And Mr. President is going to say, on account of certain inconsistencies, on account of some things that I think are not in the larger national interest, I will have to withhold accent and send it back for them to look at it again. By the time it goes back, we are thinking in terms of all this uh, passage of the of the um, of the budget and things. It is kept, and by the time they are through with it to revisit the electoral act, it is a little too too late in the day for it to be done. And they say, well, so as not to scuttle the election, let us just continue with that. What have we lost? Not primaries. We have lost the real deal, which is the electronic transmission of results. I want Mr. President to do two things for me. Number one, sign that accent to that bill and immediately send in another bill that seeks to repeal the aspect of direct primaries. Don't throw away the two of them. On, or on the alternative, except it is too late, just like the PIA, as it was, because it, before it became a PIB, you unbundle them. Let electronic transmission of results go independently so that they can deal with that as a, 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 a separate body. And then the primaries can also be dealt with as a separate body. But better still, if it's too late in the day, let Mr. President, if he means well, because the target here is not the direct or indirect primaries, it's not. The target here is to bring in a conversation that will make sure that Mr. President brings back. They are afraid of the issue of electronic transmission of results. I dare say that APC is scared stiff of that because they've seen what is done in Anambra State, okay? So manipulating things, which is usually done in collation, is removed completely, and they don't like it. I put APC to the task and say, you are afraid of electronic transmission of results. As a result, you are bringing in a certain controversy that will ensure that Mr. President, acting in all good conscience, sends that bill back to you. And by the time you now come to debate it again, there's going to be argument, agreement and disagreement and back and forth, and it becomes too late. And we would have lost that confidence of even when it's approved, because the moment is returned, the confidence of the people that is sky high right now will start to drop. And we don't want that. So we are saying, Mr. President, accent to it and immediately send in something that says this direct primaries, we won't have any problems with you. All we want is that results are transmitted directly from the polling unit. That's what gives me confidence to go into the field to contest for the governorship of a quiet bomb state. Because I know that once the results are from the polling unit, I'm as good as can be. I'm as happy as can be. But once it goes into all this uh, collation, no collation, and the, the abracadabra that nobody ever understood, I think that um, is something that people like me will be very discouraged. And that's what you want to hear. But trust me, you're not going to have your way this time around. All right. Um, as the president travels around the world to market Nigeria, to France, and to South Africa, and, you know, whoever else, um, marketers or manufacturers, rather, here in the country are complaining. And it's uh, on the Guardian newspapers this morning. You can see it there. 
um, manufacturers lose 50% half-year profits to operating and forex costs. Also goes on to say, epileptic power supply exchange rates raise uh, cost of production by 30%. Uh, stakeholders urge uh, federal government to reschedule existing loans and grant tax holidays and some other stuff firms. But the, the main catch really is the, the struggle of manufacturers or manufacturers are dealing with here in the country um, um, and uh, dealing with you know, some of the things that make it even harder uh, to excel in this space. Uh, so Mr. Ayai talk, can yeah. President Buhari in any way convince investors and uh, manufacturers to invest in Nigeria? Uh, seeing the climate that we currently have here? Two things. The very first thing is that I'm a private sector person. I've never held or never accepted any appointment. I'm strictly a private sector person. In which case, I understand what it means for you to ask me to come and invest somewhere. I look at the bottom line. I'm into housing, and there are several states that have asked me, including the northern states, have asked me to come and do housing projects with them. And I just see them with them, and I'm asking them one, two, three questions. What's your market like? What are you willing to guarantee? What are the sweetness you are putting on the table? Okay, yes, you have those numbers. I get like, are we targeting civil servants? Are we targeting the organized private sector or the informal sector? We have to sit down and ask all these questions. And more often than not, you ask a commissioner for housing these questions, and he's just looking at you and he's like, bros, you are talking too much grammar. All they are saying is that we get money. Come, make we put this thing on the table. This is your own. This is our own. That is over ninety percent. There was a time that my 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 my, my former governor Ata is still around. I got. I was the first Nigerian that got a facility from Shelter Africa for any state government. A particular governor told him that if Akiten Yeto does not come to me, I will take my siren and go to Uyo, and that will be embarrassed. The government said. I went to the guy and sat down as a governor. All he was telling me was how much, how much, how much. I said, sir, this is a loan. And I need to see the exit strategy. Whatever I was talking, I was irritating him. Because as at this time, I brought, was it 3.8 or $4.8 million to acquire him to do the Shelter Africa Estate. And all he was seeing was $4.8 million, $4.8 million. And I, I, I had such a hard time trying to tell him, sir, I'm a private sector person. If I'm going for this loan, I need to be able to convince them on the exit strategy. He said, hey, government will do it. But I said, sir, it doesn't work that way. At the end of the day, I walked away. I could have made so much money. But I've walked away with my integrity, with my head held high as a professional, that of Abong Victor Atta, the money was collected, the estate was built, the full money was repaid. And today, on my birthday, on the 1st of November, the MD of Shelter Africa recorded a message that if you listen to your heart will, no matter how hard you are, you, you, you feel good. What am I trying to say? When these people go to negotiate loans, to start with, Mr. President goes there ceremonially. He's supposed to go there to sign off. I don't know who can convince me that Mr. President, I mean, what is he going to negotiate? What is he going to say? He's a technical people that do the groundwork, that do the analysis, they do the defense, they do everything. And when all is done, Mr. President goes there ceremonially to sign. So when Mr. President is going today to negotiate, to, to seek for, to, is that his job? Can that be the job of the president of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, scouting? Where is the Minister of Investment, Trade and Investment? Where are all the different bureaus on investment that are supposed to be doing the work? Where, where is it the place of Mr. President? Mr. President goes there to sign off and not to scout for. There's something I don't understand. There's something that is not adding up. There's not something that's not adding up. If Mr. President wants to take a, a, a vacation or something, let's... Yeah. let's but aside, yeah. aside the yes, president, yeah. you know, and the angles concerning the president, you know, can we also share a little bit about, um, you know, how difficult it is for these manufacturers here in the country and, and those who, you know, have, you know, brought their, their businesses down here in Nigeria, having to deal Brother, with epileptic power I supply one and some of, of all of that. You don't need to go far. I am one of them. I built an estate for two years 
with all the transformers installed, I have found it difficult to get my estate connected. Estate with all infrastructure in place, everything, fire hydrant, water treatment plant, all the roads asphalted, full landscaping, everything. I don't have power in my estate as we speak. This is national television, international television. Why is that so? Is there any payment that I've not made? Is there anything I have not done? Nothing. I don't have light. I run generator for two years after the whatever the transformers have been installed. I hope the minister in charge of power and the rest can hear this and take me up on it. What is the problem? Now, this is what people face in this country in doing business. The bureaucracy is just awful. I can't even get money from the bank. Did you hear in one of the papers, you saw that the banks are willing to pay the fines than to embark on new loans. Did you see that? And then what is government telling people that are investors? Are they telling them that you cannot have investment comes in different ways? Some people have the technicalities. They have the know-how. They have the workmanship. They need the funding. Some people have the funding. They are looking for a way to invest. All these different dynamics are things that interplay and create an investment environment in a country. It is holistic. Mm -hmm. And when the banks say, we cannot give new loans, we rather pay the bank to debt ratio, you know, that, that fine, than to give new loans. These are the sort of policies that the, Fed, the central bank should say it is beyond fines. Because if you look at the fine, it's just a slap on the risk. And you're asking them to lend because you want the economy to be buoyant. And they have to do it. They must make their profit. They listen to the two sides of the divide, but make sure that the economy, the system is protected. Right now, we that are in the private sector have no level of protection within the system. And it is not okay. It's not enough. And, you know, as, as we are speaking today, your friend in China is watching this. Anybody that they told about China, about investment in Nigeria, they are looking for some key, you know, um, stations in Nigeria. And as you are showing this paper, this paper, I'm sure, is shown by all the A-rated stations. Of course, we are, we are, um, Plus TV is one of them. And they are seeing it. And when Mr. President finishes addressing the, the people and walks out, they are going to carry a copy of this letter, of this paper, and show to the Nigerian team and say, All right. bros, what do you people say about this? And they are going to say, oh boy, leave that thing. So it's either they are going to think of the country. Anyway, bottom line, in Nigeria, the investors are, are, are having a hard time, the manufacturers. And let me tell you, they said something about reducing the fines. Government is looking for money from everywhere, including raising taxes. And yet the investors or the manufacturers are looking for how you can bring down these taxes so that they can survive. I'll end with this a little thing. I went with my partner to Rwanda to register a company. When we got there, they just gave us a, a console, like um, a tablet, and we pa, 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 within 30 minutes, we had finished the registration, within 30 minutes. And they told us, give us 24 hours and you get your certificate. And we said, payment. They said, no, you can't talk of payments now. We need to help you to grow so that when you make the business and you're successful, then you will be able to take the taxes from the successful business. I looked at my partner and we said, sounds good, let's wait. About 15 minutes to the 24 hours they gave us, we got a mail. Please, in 15 minutes, log in and your um, certificate of registration will be ready. We logged in 15 minutes and there it was. You can either print and use or you come and get a hard copy, any of the two. What am I saying? These are people who understand investment dynamics. We are not going to kill you. We are going to fatten you up like a lamb, like a pig, so that your sales value will be higher. But in our own, we are draining the milk from the pig from youth. And as of a result, we are having all these pigs that look like, like uh, they, are, they, are, they are malnourished. All right. That is antithetical to investment logic and ideology. All right, Ezekiel Yanitok, uh, thank you very much for your time this Monday morning for kicking off the week for us, and uh, we wish you a beautiful week ahead. Thanks for speaking with thank us. Thank you, thank you, thank Thanks. you. Absolutely.
And uh, just before, of course, we move to our first uh, major conversation for today, let's take you back in history to the year 1923. We're speaking about a guy called James Montgomery, who on this day, of course, began his struggle for freedom after he was accused falsely of rape. Um, and, of course, he eventually was released in 1949. Her name was Mami Snow, who was a mentally disabled white woman from Illinois and claimed that James Montgomery, a black veteran and factory worker, raped her. He was promptly thrown in jail, in jail, spent more than 25 years in prison before his conviction was overturned and he was released. From the start, his trial, of course, seemed ill-fated. Uh, the local Ku Klux Klan members threatened Montgomery's lawyer during the proceedings. He was eventually or found guilty and sentenced to life in prison. But while serving time, uh, Montgomery studied law in an attempt to prove his innocence. Um, his attorney, Kutner, discovered a medical report from Snow's hospitals uh, revealing that not only was she never raped, she was also likely a virgin. Montgomery was eventually then once again released in 1949. Very interesting story. Quite interesting. Yes, it is. All right, and uh, that's what we have for you today in history. We'll take a short break. When we come back, we're going into our first major conversation for today where the National Union of uh, Rail Work or, um, Railway Workers are threatening to go on a three-day warning strike from the 18th of November, uh, complaining about their working conditions and remunerations. We'll be talking about that after the short break.